Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. Today we're gonna go through Twitter, look at some commodity and stock market related information together. And I'll give you my financial opinions. If you want to uh, follow me, you can follow me at finding underscore finance uh, on Twitter if you'd like to follow. So let's go over some information that I've been looking at and watching. Uh, it says, this is one of the most bullish charts in today's macro environment. It begs the question, what if oil has another big move? Inflation reaccelerates and interest rates need to stay higher for longer. Equ equity markets would not appreciate this. And this is the price of oil. We can also draw a, a lower, lower trend line here, down here. And you have one, two, three humps, and then the breakout. This is a back test on a longer term uh, movement. So generally, you get a trend line, you break out of it, and then you go to retest it, which we did already, and we could see a big move to the upside in oil. And I think people are starting to figure out and realize, like, hey, look, oil broke, it broke out of a basically a falling wedge here, and it's starting to move higher. And what are the ramifications of that? Now, some people are talking about a pretty big deficit in oil, and inventories could be eaten through quite quickly. That would lead to much higher oil prices, which is inflationary. Um, higher oil prices is the mechanism that transfers, we'll say, dollars in the system into the consumer price index. And it's really two ways that, that you can do that through oil prices. Um, the first way is money comes into the system in greater quantities and the supply of oil lags. And that's been historically the, the supply response. It's, it's that lag between money coming into the system and the supply um, lagging. Well, what's happening now is the supply is not there. <laughs> it's, it's not even about money coming into the system anymore. It's about the supply of oil. And that there could be inflationary, irrespective of how much money comes into the system. That is a huge difference versus other times in history. Now, the, the, Kathy Wood, I, I don't understand some of the stuff she, she says here, but she said, <laughs> he writes, come on, folks. She's saying oil demand will drop by 30 million barrels per day in five years. Do the math required to the, for that to happen, as she clearly didn't. Oil demand dropped 6% in March 2020 when the global economy shut down. And I, I don't know, I don't know where her, I can't share the same paradigm as Kathy would to even have an argument for her. Uh, she comes up with these ridiculous claims like oil's never going over $20 again or $30 or whatever her claim was back in the day. I think it was $20. And here we are. Uh, well above that, uh, we went all the way to about what 120 or so, and now she's saying that oil demand could plunge by 30. percent I, I, I think oil demand's going to increase by 30 percent over <laughs> five years is a higher likelihood than a decline by 30 percent. Let alone the supply side, the supply side could get hit pretty bad um, because we're not investing in oil. Uh, there isn't. It's something like 60% or 70% of oil in the entire world um, isn't used for transportation. So the other 30 or 30 to 40% is used in transportation. So 60 to 70% is not used for transportation. And I, she apparently she thinks that the entire maybe automotive fleet uh, can be rolled over by that time. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't want to read the article. It's kind of pointless because I don't think that what she is saying is even possible. Uh, one of my highest conviction charts, uh, this is oil again. It says a massive 18 year consolidation, breakout and back test. Look at the gains we typically see after these long monthly wicks highlighted. Multiple hundreds of dollars coming for oil. And we've got these wicks, that's all the big support. We've got lots of support right where we're at. That's where the trend line is. Again, I've already talked about it. We, we do a breakout a retest, there's your falling wedge, and then we get a big old break. 
Um, so he's thinking multiple hundreds of dollars, two, three hundred dollars. Um, I'm in the same exact camp. I think that we're uh, probably looking at multiple hundreds of dollars in oil and also in uranium. And I think it's about to start now. <laughs> very, very soon. I'll just say that. Uh, yeah, we talked with Gabe. Gabe came on the, the channel. Uh, so here's something else that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, mortgage demand is surging as rates sit at their lowest level since September. Mortgage demand jumps nearly 28% in one week as interest rates drop to lowest point in months. Now, this is, this is really important to understand because this is part uh, of what drives money into the system is credit. And what I think is happening is that the affordability through the mortgage rates is, has, has gotten to a level where demand is really pulled back. And as the, if that is a true statement, what we would see is if interest rates fell, we would see mortgage demand jump um, upward, which means that I don't think there's a supply problem where we went into a hyper supply phase. I think the affordability is what's basically slowing down the housing market. It's not an overproduction of new homes. If we had an overproduction of new homes, your mortgages wouldn't jump. You'd get this massive flood of homes, and it would really slow down the markets. It's basically the market is topping out and ready to turn over. I don't think that's necessarily the case. It, I mean, it is slowing down. I don't think it's necessarily topping out, and it heavily relies on what the interest rates are going to be. The question then becomes, are interest rates going to remain high? For a long enough period to basically keep the affordability down and crush the demand. And if the Federal Reserve does that, why would they do that? And if they want to hold the inflation down and they want to hold the housing market demand down, they're going to have to hold rates probably close to where they're at or a little bit higher and hold them for a pretty long time if they want to hold, basically crush that demand. If that's the case, then the debt that's rolling over at these higher interest rates could pose a problem, uh, depending on how long we stay up here. So they're really caught in a, in, a, in a difficult situation where they're trying to control inflation from credit expansion through the real estate market. And the debt rolling over and new debt being released to fund a lot of these things and having it all be at much higher interest rates, which means that the interest payments on the debt would go up dramatically. That's the, the situation they're in. And that is inflationary. So they're kind of stuck in inflationary land either way they go. Either they lower the rates, they get inflation from the housing market. If they keep rates high, they get inflation from the interest payments, social security payments, and all the obligations that they have to fund through that um, issuance of, of, of new bonds, which is also inflationary. Uh, which says, I cover many up... Okay, so this one I'll skip. Some quiet accumulation here. Segra Capital has doubled their position in Denison Mines the last three months. Uh, so we do see some positioning by some larger uh, players into the uranium space. Uh, I think uranium's on the precipice of hopefully a big move. Uh, we've seen some of our guys, and I'll pull this up real quick just to show you guys um, what's going on and what I see. And I'll show you the housing starts too, because that data just came out as well. So here's uh, housing starts for United States. And we're right on that trend line right now. We're at about 1.4 million. It is 1.39 or 1.382 million. Uh, it's right about average. And what we don't want to see is we don't want to see a, a large move lower like that. That means that the, the bull market is done in housing and we've gotten into a hyper supply phase and it is crashing. Um, we're still holding steady here and we, we don't want that to crash. Uh, if it crashes, what could happen is we could see a recession. 
that is that is when I get afraid, especially when that dives down. Now, there's no other leading indicators like delinquency rates, foreclosures, all that stuff that has me worried. So I'm just kind of waiting, sitting here, watching the numbers go by month by month to see what happens. And talking about uranium, uh, here's Camco. Camco is looking really good. Let me get off logarithmic here. We've got this nice big old candlestick here that's looking fantastic. And we kind of zoom out on, and these are the dailies. We've got the, I, what I consider to be the Jesse Livermore pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven's down here. And I think we are breaking the downtrend here to the upside where we could see a big old move out of this thing. And that move out of the cylinder, if we kind of back out, uh, the move out of the cylinder could be quite large. So if we were to look at last uh, break, we can kind of go here. And I mean, this one, it blew way out <laughs> over everything. Um, if that were to happen again, and let's let's try to simulate this. And I were just to take, oh, hit the wrong one there. Shouldn't need bars pattern. There it is. And, and let's just say that this is the fractal. And we're going to have to go kind of big here. So, and I were to raise this fractal up and have it be the same as last time, it could be something on the lines of this, where, let's just zoom back in real quick. So here's your fractal of last times. And you can see that it's basically uh, the same. You can see that the lead-in pattern is this. This guy that comes down is that guy right there. You can see how this thing um, basically came about here. And this, this lead-in pattern is the same accumulation pattern as this. This is your bear trap. This could be the bear trap right where we're going uh, here. It didn't pull back as far as last cycle. Um, but if you were to look at it from this perspective, it, it looks pretty close. So if we go to an all and we kind of look, you know, how high could we go if this fractal is lined up? Now, I don't know if it's lined up properly and we're just playing with numbers. This is not uh, a projection. I'm just playing with things. But, you know, it could go $350 or it might be a little bit lower than that, maybe 200 plus. That is a possibility. Um, and if the fractal lines up just like it does, this is kind of what it looks like. I don't know if that's going to be the ultimate number. What I'm saying is there's a lot of upside. There's a big asymmetric. You know, the symmetry here is much more favored to the upside than it is the downside, especially than from where we're at. And we've broken this um, downtrend line to the upside, and we're starting to get running a little bit. So that looks really promising uh, for that. Uh, here's DNN. So this is another uranium company, Denison Mines. And we've got, basically, you can see this guy coming down and we've broken out. Maybe we'll do a back test here. Maybe this is all it has. We don't have to do a full back test. So um, I think we're going to get running here at any point. And I'm not the only person who sees this. Obviously, John's been charting this stuff out. Um, you can see that we had a large squeeze here. And how it squeezed up where the, the highs and the lows um, come together. So the highs here and the lows kept getting uh, in a tighter and tighter range-bound area and broke to the upside. So I think we have the opportunity here to have a pretty big run to the upside. Now, Luke, Luke brings something up that I think about quite a bit. It says something seems to be happening in commodities. Bigger picture, massive U.S. yield curve inversion and seemingly significant commodity supply tightness is not something anyone alive has seen or traded before. Thoughts are welcome. I completely agree with that. And what what happens, what, what's different in this setup here is everything that's happened kind of in the set, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, all the way up till 2020 
Um, I would even say that the seventies are not the same. And let's, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. And I can explain exactly what that is with, with charts. Cause that's kind of what I do is with charts. So if we were to look at the PPI to CPI ratio on a long-term perspective, and we kind of draw out this chart of what it looks like, we were in a declining condition where basically technology and the abundance of commodities have declined the producer price index continually lower, leading to what we'll call a more productive commodity uh, production growth. We'll call it that. Now, the thing that's kind of interesting here is we've got a double bottom here where we could be changing that around and this goes higher, where commodity prices outpace the consumer price index. And we go into a very inflationary environment. Um, that's what this chart is kind of telling me and signaling me that the producer price index will outpace the consumer price index. Uh, which is an inflationary environment, which in the 1960s and 70s, this was the move here in a overall lowering move downward. This here is showing me that it's a double bottom where we could be go entering into an, a very long term or ever greater commodity price outpacing the consumer price, which is going to be a very large inflationary period. Um, that is what he's describing, and this is the chart to basically back up what is being described. In supply side commodities, the commodities on the supply side being in short supply would cause this to do that and cause this double bottom and have a chart that looks like this. So that could be an explanation of what's to come. Uh, here's another one. Tavi says, we just saw one of the worst two-month declines in retail sales since the global financial crisis and the COVID lockdowns. The squeeze on consumers is real and markets are starting to treat bad news as bad news. And here is your U.S. retail sales way down there. Um, but here's the thing. If you have a commodity shortage, you're going to see retail sales get smoked. And things are going to become less affordable. And we're going to go into recession. And, and, and. But it's from the supply commodities tightness. The way that you increase sales is you produce more. But what if you can't produce more? What if you're commodity constrained and people are fighting for commodities to produce more and more products? And I think that's the environment that could potentially be coming. I don't know if anyone has seen this environment, and I don't know what it's going to look like necessarily. And we could see signals that. Uh, throw people off that we normally look at because what usually happens is you get a demand hit. People say, okay, we're going to get a recession and then supply comes back online. What if supply doesn't come back online? Th that's where it gets a little funky. And yeah, it could be stagflation. Uh, demand perma bear IEA raising their 2023 demand forecast by 0.2 million barrels per day to 1.9 million barrels per day, while the SPR-adjusted oil deficit remained flat at 399 million barrels in November. Despite sluggish Chinese demand, what happens in 2023 with China demand normalizing and the SPR largely ending? Uh, this is what it would have done. It would have came down to this level here if they had not released the strategic petroleum reserves. So what they did is they basically bolstered the commercial inventories um, throughout the world at the deficit of SPR. And they basically held the pricing of oil um, to where we are today. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, the cost of yield curve control in one chart. Bank of Japan's balance sheet assets to GDP now at record levels, now approaching 140%. And this is the Bank of Japan's balance sheet versus GDP. And they've been doing aggressive QE uh, in buying their uh, bonds to keep that bond market uh, under wraps. And I know there's stuff going on over there uh, with their yields and their bonds and bond prices. And it's, it's getting pretty interesting. Uh, I don't, I'm not a fan of bonds in this type of environment. Uh, I think precious metals, 
is my go-to, uh, and that's where I store my wealth. There's no way I'd be buying bonds of any you know, of any kind. Um, bonds can work in the short term if we do get market slowdowns. It's possible, uh, but if we have commodity tightness, and if we have tightness in oil, I think that we're going to get into a very weird situation where GDP can't really grow. And what you what you get is you get an M2 money supply versus GDP where you start racing these these two things. Uh, it's the relationship between money in the system and your gross domestic product. But if you're commodity constrained, your gross domestic product could get, dis- could get uh, constrained here. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to kill the credit expansion of the M2 money supply. That's why they continually raise rates. But if your GDP starts to fall from a commodity constraint, this starts to go lower, they're going to have to kill this side too to keep this imbalance between each other. Otherwise, you're still going to get inflation, even though the M2 money supply could shrink at the same time. That is an ugly looking situation. Um, But I do think, you know, if it kills enough demand, I'm sure we can get something back in balance at some point. But that is, that's kind of what I'm seeing. Uh, but I'll, I'll end it there, guys. <clears throat> We've got a lot of good information there. And if you guys need help with anything in this commodity bull market that's coming up, definitely subscribe to finding-value.com. Um, use the word discount in the coupon code. I do go over a lot of uranium stocks. You can see what my portfolio holds. Uh, we do have a platinum question and answer session, 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, basically when this video is being released. And you can go over there and ask me questions because uh, I usually stay on about till about three hours, about 10 a.m. And you can ask questions. Uh, you can ask about uranium. I think uranium's in a sweet spot right here. I think energy service companies and even the oil exploration production companies are looking quite good uh, for a move higher with oil breaking out and doing that retest that we saw uh, in this uh, session here. So uh, that's what I've got for today. Give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.